Hello YouTube, welcome to the backstory. We're trying to get the backstory on indie games to give a little light to indie game creation stories and a behind the scenes look at what it takes to make a game. I'm once again joined by my co-host James and today we have on Van and Rob from Game Sage. How are you guys doing? Ah uh, yeah, pretty Hello, good man. man. How about you? Ah, pretty well myself. Alrighty, Go so on, we're yes, getting yeah. into Mantle. Which uh, you guys might recognize from the thumbnails of all of our videos. This was actually the first game we ever recorded for the channel, but it didn't work. It broke. The recording <laughs> just broke, and we were never able to release it. But here we are. We've come full circle. You've updated the game, and uh, now we get to give it its, uh, its uh, a proper go. Yeah, that's right. Alrighty, let's get into it, James. Right, so this is billed as an emotional platformer through the mantle of the Earth, hence the name. Was the emotional journey there from the beginning, or did you just make the platforming and go, ah, oh, we, we need to put a story behind this? Uh, so from the beginning of the idea, it was actually like, I always wanted to incorporate a story within the platforming. Uh, I really took inspiration from a game called Celeste. And I really mm -hmm. like how they incorporated uh, background meaning and theming into their like platforming games. That's what I kind of wanted to create. It was always like an important thing. From a marketing view, uh, at Game Test Production, acting as the producer for this game, the game came to a point in development where it was very much so a platformer. And I believe that moving it towards an emotional platformer allowed more opportunities for people to get more value from the game, you know, and have it more appeal for, for a lot more people. So on the business side, that was the reasoning besides that as well. We've got this mechanic, whereas if you teleport to the teleporter uh, yeah. while it's in its upward arc, then yeah. you'll get a little, little jump sort of boost coming to it. Was that difficult to nail down? Was there a lot of balancing that went into when that jump applies versus when it doesn't? Um, so yeah, originally, um, when we're like talking about, um, like the motional movement is kind of like the crux of a platformer. So at the start, when we started this back in uni days, just say it was like a six month production time. I think we spent four of those months making sure to get them like the movement and teleporting exactly how we wanted it. So, so if you teleport early, you get more of a push up. If you teleport late, it's more of like a fast, a fast push. So it's a, a great aspect to do with timing as well. Uh, when you teleport affects your jump. Right, so when you were making the fire level, the wind level, whatever, what came first? Did the emotion come first, or did the gameplay of wind or fire come first? Uh, so, ultimately, the gameplay came first, because it was all about... The original thing of the game is, like, with platformers, you always have the character being, like, the main character the player plays as, as like the thing that you kind of base your whole game around. So like Mario, um, Mario being able to jump is kind of like the whole main mechanic around it. Yeah, there's other mechanics, but it's always based around that. Celeste being able to dash with your character. Where with this game, when like designing it, I wanted to kind of flip that and I was like, oh, uh, what would happen if the player was actually pretty useless and everything evolved around an object that he had and that object interacted with um, things around him. So we thought of like ideas of uh, how the teleporter, which came to be, would interact with those environmental changes. And then we came up with like wind being able to move it, fire being able to like uh, transform it and then like make it bounce and stuff like that. You've gone with a, uh, a pixely, uh, I don't know, I don't know the technical definition between 16 bit and 8 bit, but did you ever feel like that was a limitation that you weren't able to put in detail that you wanted to? I think it's always, yeah, when you um, when you go more pixelated game, you need to try to find that line of like, it looks unique and it has a lot of detail, even though it can be uh, looking a little bare sometimes. Ultimately, it's around like the art style or like the art style you choose and stuff like that. We had like a, we were really lucky because we ended up finding um, a guy who's pretty, I, 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 I really liked his art style and stuff like that. So Van was able to hook us up with him and then he was a we were able to talk and like envision like what we wanted the game to kind of look like. Yeah, Luke Hansard, a really talented uh, pixel artist I've worked with in the past, 
So originally this game had some pre-existing assets that were taken from the Unity asset store and you know, some of it created by ourselves, but it really needed an artist's touch to bring out the, the uniqueness, as Rob said. All these subtle little details work in conjunction to make the game not feel too lifeless, so to speak. You know, and that, that's definitely proved to be a real challenge, but I'm quite happy with the final result. It was a, it was a combination effort of, of many months to get to, to this stage. Now, you guys currently have a Kickstarter. I'll be sure to link that down below. Was that like a necessary thing? Was Were bills catching up to you and you felt you needed the money to continue working on the game? On a business side, I think that indie game developers can sometimes get to the to the mindset where money is not important. Uh, it's all about the game. Ultimately, though, we want to come to a situation where the development of games can be at least part of our livelihood. <laughs> it would be nice if uh, to receive a paycheck from Steam or from Kickstarter to help with the bills, the groceries, especially in these COVID times. It's more of a representation that we want to make the development of games more than just a hobby, something more like a vocation. And a Kickstarter represents that. And what was the goal with going with Kickstarter over Patreon? I think there's a few different considerations in terms of this project. When we first were looking to create a Kickstarter or looking to go for funding, the game was heavily in development already. Uh, in this case, it was uh, very close to being finished, really much so going to the polishing stage. A Patreon infers that continual work will have to be put out again and again and again, and we're just not too sure uh, how to manage it, to be honest, you know. Uh, this is one of our, our earliest ventures working with Burning Light Studios, and it's the first time we've ever gone to crowdfunding. So I think it's also a matter of uh, working out the, those uh, issues in regards to financing. But finance, actually, financing is definitely something that we'll have to investigate more in the future. Were you ever worried that the um, deep themes of this game would turn people off who are looking for a, perhaps a more light-hearted experience? Um, I think it's kind of something you need to take a risk on in the sense of if you want to tell a certain story, it's always going to have that tension of whether or not it's viewed as a good thing or a bad thing. And ultimately, I wanted to make it like a story or a game based around like the feelings I had, especially during the start and then how in a way based it around like my personal like feeling because I went through uh, some personal stuff of like having that depression stage. So I think it was more important just to get it out there and for people to who are going through that, who can actually see, who can maybe use it as help or anything like that. I think it's more important than getting that backlash of it because I'm not really afraid of that because I'd rather it being there as a, if it even helps like one person, that's more important to me, I think. I think that depression and mental health is definitely something that many people can relate to. Uh, that malaise of feeling trapped or isolated, stuck, it's a very complicated affair. And as Rob was alluding to, if we can contribute to spreading an awareness, a message or you know, advocating for anybody to receive some kind of help, uh, even if it's to a level where they can just uh, feel relatable to the story, then I think that's a, it's a very worthwhile pursuit, even, uh, worth any potential backlash. Any secrets in the game? Like, if you can you go up over the top there and end up at the level select from Mario? When we decided to more focus on making it more like platforming and making it more about that that story we've been talking about, if we have like secret areas or like you know rewards or something like that, it kind of takes away from the story because it's you're focusing on other things rather than what you're doing. Like in Celeste, taking collector strawberries, like little collectibles, you're kind of like your mind is in a different spot. You're like, oh, what's in here? Maybe what's in there? You're not really thinking about like how can I uh, how. How am I going to get past this level or like what do those words mean or stuff like that. So we decided to actually go against it, which is away from the trope of platformers because we wanted to lean more heavily into just making the player focus more of what they're doing, the level that they're doing. Uh, so you touched on right then that you started this game during university. Was this for a university project? Yeah, so this was actually my final project um, I had at university. And um, yeah, so it started off as like, uh, for final projects, you come up with a few ideas and then you break it down to one and then everyone pitches their idea and then people choose what teams they want to go on. And then uh, this game was chosen by a few people, so we ended up doing it. 
after Rob completed his final project, it's only afterwards uh, GameSage created a relationship with his team, bringing like studios to take it further. Yeah. I saw the game on itch.io, thought it looked pretty cool, so I reached out for, to Rob for, to, get a, to get a sandwich, and we had a great discussion, hit it off, and we decided to work on it further. I think thought there was uh, some real potential there. So was, did you find the game easier to work on when it was a part of your university curriculum, or easier once you were more freed up? From the academics so ultimately i think leaving uni definitely made it a little bit more easy because when you have uni you kind of it's more like the game isn't kind of the front center in the sense of like you're focusing on the game a lot but you're also focusing about other classes marks and things like that which can get in the way even though like you choose to do the game you're choosing to do the degree it feels when you're at uni it always feels like a little forced in a sense of like you have to work on this it's not really a choice so yeah after leaving uni and when uh, me and van talked about it it was more i think it was more exciting for me and uh the team and was i think we put way more hours outside of uni than we did before because it was kind of our choice and it was something that we really wanted to bring to life it's always great that's uh working with a team where the project is really one, a passion project, so to speak, you know? And I think that that really shines through when people care about the quality of the work. We're very fortunate to work with a really talented composer. His name is Stephen Mellon, who uh, did all of the background tracks for this game. Uh, so did, did you come to him because of his music or did you request that he make a track similar to this? I was always a big fan of his music, having worked with him in the past some of our other games, uh, Mage and Quest for Magic. And since I had a bit of a relationship with him and I was a fan of his work, I reached out to him and had a look at some of his work. And that's how we came to the conclusion to use him again for this. How many people have you got working on your team on this game? So there's me and Troy, who was the original from uh, uni days. Uh, originally, there was there was four of us from uni, but two of them decided not to uh, follow through with the game. And then, nice. And then, um, yeah, so two of them decided not to follow through the game. So it's just me and Troy. And um, so it's just me and Troy. And then Game Sage joined. So uh, Scott became uh, Game Sage, kind of a like go-to programmer so you really helped us through a lot and then became uh worked on the game as like a visual person as well so i think working on the game like mechanically and like design wise there's probably like four of us now again so we already covered this a little bit before but do you think it was easier working inside of uni or outside with your extended team i honestly think it was much easier outside of uni at uni final projects are known to be doomed that there's barely ever any ever going to be a good final project just because of it's a it's like your first ever production of like six months so team members tend to be more of like um tend to not work and stuff like that so with mental inexperience, inexperience is a, a great word so with mantle we decided more of a relationship where i would overlook a lot of the things so it meant i had to overlook what everyone was doing plan out everyone's work so it was a bit more strenuous but then after uni we were able to like work with game stage game stage is more experienced so able to show us like more industry standard uh, techniques and views of like how so we got to plan out more that's why even though this period where we worked on it was maybe the same maybe a bit less than uni we've almost probably doubled or tripled the amount of work we we're able to get done in that time period because of it so we're gonna wrap it up here thank you again for coming on i hope you both had a good time we definitely did yeah it's been great great to chat is there anything you guys want to add? If anybody wants to contribute to our Kickstarter, you can find our stuff by searching for Mando Kickstarter. And we also have our Steam page as well. Make sure to find us on Steam, wishlist, and uh, check us out. Now down below, you'll see links if you'd like to play the game and support the studio for yourself. Also, if you'd like to support us, you could like the video. We've got a Discord link down below. Regardless, we will catch you in the next episode. Still doesn't feel natural. <laughs> I still feel like I'm missing. It's missing something. It's been worse. <laughs>